Um, welcome everyone to the first keynote session of the 2020 Jobs and Development Conference. Our keynote speaker today is Ekaterina Zhurevskaya. Ekaterina is a professor of economics at the Paris School of Economics, and her research interests are in political economics, economic history, and development economics. She has published in top economic journals such as American Economic Review, Federal Journal of Economics, and Journal of Political Economy, as well as in top political science journals such as American Political Science Review and American Journal of Political Science. In 2018, Ekaterina was awarded the Birgit Grodel Award, which is a biannual award by the European Economic Association, awarded to a European based female economist with a significant contribution to economic profession. And she has worked on such topics like the effect of media on political persuasion, on the spread of nationalism in such countries as pre-war Germany, Russia and the Balkans. Uh, another area of her research is political institutions, state capture, corruption, economics of transition, but also she has worked extensively <coughs> on the long-term legacies and effects of empires and of political shocks. And the paper she will present today belongs to that, to that field and is about the forced migration and human capital evidence from post-World War II population transfer. Um, Ekaterina, thanks so much for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Piotr. And uh, I would like to first start with uh, saying that I'm delighted to be part of this conference and I'm just only very sad that we couldn't meet in person in Warsaw. That would have been even, even better, but thanks very much for putting together this super interesting program and I'm happy uh, to be here and I'm happy to hear your feedback uh, on our work and also thanks for inviting me to present this work. Usually in economics, we present the ongoing work. This is this just came out, but uh, I think it might have been a good choice. It must have been a good choice for this conference because, as you're going to see, it uh, talks uh, about uh, development, forced migrations, and Poland, which is uh, an important uh, sort of focal point. It was supposed to be uh, in Warsaw after all. So this is joint work with Sasha Becker, Elena Grossfeld, Pauline Grosjean, and Mika Wollander. And uh, in order to motivate what we're doing, I would like to start with uh, a quote, not from academic literature at all. In fact, this is a quote from a best-selling autobiographical novel of Amos Oz called A Tale of Love and Darkness. And if you haven't read this book, which is a beautiful book, I very much recommend you doing this, not for academic purposes, just for pleasure. And in this book, Amos Oz gives a testimony of his aunt Sonia who is uh, describing how she, how she lives uh, in uh, uh, Jerusalem. And let me uh, just quote from, from, from this book. Why is she a road sweeper? So as to keep two talented daughters at university. Food, they save on. Clothes, they save on those two. Accommodation, they all share a single room. All so that the studies and textbooks, they won't be short. It was always like that with Jewish families, she continues. That's the testimony of Aunt Sonia. They believed that education was an investment for the future, the only thing that no one can ever take away from your children. Even if, heaven forbid, there is another war, another revolution, more discriminatory laws, your diploma, you can always fold up quickly, hide in the seams of your clothes, and run away to wherever Jews are allowed to live. So the reason why I picked this quote as a motivation for this work is because it actually uh, talks directly about the mechanism which we are going to study in our work. So our main question is uh, whether and how forced migration affects subsequent generations. And of course, there's a lot of ideas which have been floating around in, in economics literature and, in economic and academic literature uh, that um, being uprooted by force or expropriated may increase the subjective value of investing in portable assets, and in particular, in most portable asset of all, which is the human capital through education. And it's not just the Aunt Sonia who uh, 
uh, entertains this idea. In fact, uh, it dates back to at least George Stigler. At the same time, even though this idea is not new at all, uh, it, uh, and I will refer to it as uh, quote unquote uprootedness hypothesis, it is notoriously hard to test because of the multitude of uh, other factors which are affecting uh, people at the time of uh, forced migration or expropriation. Let me just uh, uh, name the most important ones, by, but not that, that will not be the full list. First of all, migrants differ from native population along many other dimensions, particularly cultural dimensions like ethnicity, language, religion, and all of these affect the choices as far as uh, investment in human capital and, and physical capital is concerned directly. And uh, coming back to the testimony of Aunt Sonia, uh, there is a beautiful book of uh, Botticini and Eckstein, The Chosen Few, who show that the first time we observe an educational advantage of Jews vis-a-vis -vis other groups with whom they lived uh, with uh, was in the first century AD after the uh, demolition of uh, uh, temple when uh, Jewish boys were required to read religious texts. And of course, uh, that means that uh, this was the, at the time when, uh, well before Jews were forced to migrate and persecuted for the first time. So, which means essentially that not that Tote Sonia, the Aunt Sonia is wrong, what it means is that you cannot empirically separate these two effects in explaining the current um, pattern that. Uh, um, Jews usually uh, hire very much the education of their kids. So that, that would be one, one reason why it's challenging to uh, address this uh, question. Furthermore, uh, usually migrants, when they arrive to the destination, destination locations, they often lack access to productive assets. Think about, for example, land. And there's a very good example which comes from uh, the uh, great, very nice paper by Bauer and others uh, who show that uh, Germans who were displaced uh, from the territories Germany lost to, to, to Poland uh, in the Second World War and who were afterwards resettled in, the, in West Germany, they had to move to other sectors simply because you know, there were no farms for them. All farms uh, belonged to, to other Germans, to the entrenched local population. And of course, uh, that me is in, in another confounding factor. That example which I gave you had nothing to do with discrimination. It's just about the first moving advantage in a local market. At the same time, we can think of many contexts in which there are ongoing uh, cases of discrimination or sometimes very high level of discrimination of migrants and destination locations. And these also affect accumulation of physical and human capital directly. So all of these factors basically led to the situation where this so-called called, quote unquote uprootedness hypothesis was not really tested empirically before our work. The reason why we could contribute to uh, this uh, debate, let's say, with, with our paper is because we uh, are studying a large scale forced migration historical experiment, which is in many ways unique, which allows us to single out the effect of forced migration per se from all these other factors, which I just mentioned. And let me explain to you what this natural experiment is. It is essentially, the root of it is the move of Poland about 250 kilometers west on the map of Europe uh, right after the Second World War. In particular, uh, I hope you see my, my, my slides here. I'm showing you the map where uh, these uh, pink uh, shaded area, this is the territory of the so second uh, Polish Republic, which is the interwar Poland. And uh, the territory within the thick red line is the territory of current Poland, which is which in the borders, which were uh, set after the second world war. So, uh, so this is essentially what constitutes the source of our historical experiment. Poland lost these territories, which are called Kresy in Polish, and I'm going to refer to this 
territories as such, which means eastern borderlands. And uh, Poland gained the territories which are shaded uh, yellow, uh, light yellow here, which uh, are commonly referred to as Western territories. So these are the territories which used to belong to Germany. And uh, one of the uh, uh, results of this move was that Poles who lived in uh, Kresy were expelled from Kresy and moved to the territory of contemporary Poland, most of whom went to the Western territories, but some also settled in central Poland. And this is uh, what we are going to focus on. Of course, these are not the only changes in population structure which happened at the time, and I will talk a little bit more about that, but what's important for our study is uh, that uh, this particular experiment allows us to bypass the confounding factor. Why is this the case? Well, first of all, this is because this is a one-time expulsion of a group which was not discriminated at either origin or destination. Why would that be the case? Well, it's simply because that these were Poles in Poland before the move, and they were Poles in Poland after the move as well. <coughs> it's just that the poor Poland moved, so they had to move with it. Of course, that also means that they have the same ethnicity, language, and religion as uh, uh, those uh, people who are at, at destination, because Poland, after the war, became a very homogeneous country, which was not the case in the interwar war of Poland, but in the post-war Poland, that certainly is the case. And what's important is that in the Western territories part, uh, the parts which uh, Poland gained after the war, there was abundant physical capital and land which was available for all migrants coming in. And that allows us to bypass the congestion effects. Why that was the case? Because as I'm going to show you and, and, and talk about a little bit later, uh, Germans had to leave behind everything they owned when they were expelled from these territories. So we use this historical experiment and try to understand what are the effects of uh, this forced migration on incentives to accumulate uh, human capital by employing two large scale surveys, uh, which were conducted in Poland with our uh, involvement because we had we one survey was designed by us the other was uh, a big uh, Polish survey to which we added several questions they were conducted in 2015 and 2016 and in particular these surveys are special because they we added questions about the uh, ancestors uh, of uh, the respondents and particularly about the location where the ancestors of the respondents lived before Second World War. And essentially, in a nutshell, we examine educational advantage of potential educational advantage. I'm gonna show you that it actually is real of uh, uh, people uh, with uh, ancestors who come from Cressy, which means that they, uh, their families went through the episode of forced migration. Just uh, to show you uh, the main pattern in the data, uh, uh, this uh, uh, just just in a very very um, uh, brute way, this diagram uh, tells you the main point. So before uh, World War II, if we look at the territory of Second uh, Polish Republic, we can look at literacy rates uh, just uh, using the census data separately for the territory which subsequently which which is called Kresy, which subsequently was lost by Poland and the territory which is a central Poland which uh, uh, remained Polish and we see that uh, before Second World War on average literacy was lower to the east you know particularly in eastern borderlands among Poles it is generally was a very solid pattern that as you move uh, west, the education was uh, was uh, uh, higher at the time. At the same time, if we look at the secondary school attainment rate or actually any other educational outcome, I'm going to show you later, uh, in, in today's Poland, 
uh, and we uh, aggregated separately into uh, for, for two groups of poles those who have ancestors who had to uh, forcibly move from uh, Cressy to Poland and those who didn't have Cressy ancestors we see that uh, there's much higher educational attainment of uh, Poles with Cressy ancestors. So essentially what we see here is a reversal of fortune. Of course, you know, in the rest of the talk, I'll show you that this is a very robust result and it, it's not just the, you know, the summary. So here I was just showing you the raw data. So the, the next uh, uh, way to summarize our main point is to just look at the same kind of educational advantage of uh, respondents with Cressy ancestors, but by birth cohorts. Particularly here, we have, uh, we have grouped them by the birth decade. On the horizontal axis, we see the extra years of schooling uh, for respondents with ancestors from Cressy compared to respondents which don't have any ancestors from Cressy. And what we see here is that this is a very robust, it, 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 this advantage of about one year of extra schooling exists for all cohorts who had their uh, compulsory schooling after the move, after the being forcibly moved from uh, Cressy and after leaving everything behind. And it is not the case, and it's actually negative, consistent with the overall picture which I just showed you before for the generation of uh, people who uh, finished their comp compulsory schooling before the end of Second World War. So that basically gives you away the main outcome. And uh, uh, just uh, so that we are on the same ground uh, and you see where I'm going with that, uh, we, I, will, uh, I will talk about the mechanism behind this, uh, the, the results. So basically, we asked the question, what could explain this pattern? And of course, there are a bunch of different explanations potentially. Let me just uh, give away the, the punchline here too. First of all, we look at all sorts of ways in which we can try to detect the pre-existing differences in educational preferences. So I already showed you that overall there was none, but we also look and look at the uh, exact places from which the migrants come, and uh, we see no differences in uh, pre-existing education, and we also have a way to get at uh, potentially unobserved preferences uh, for educational investment. And I'm explain, I will explain you how, and uh, the punchline is that we certainly can reject that pre-existing differences are driving this result. It's all, all the action happened after people were uh, expelled. Second, we uh, look at the possibility for differential access to schooling or employment opportunities at the de destination location. So suppose that Cressy uh, migrants had different access to the, uh, to the, uh, to the assets than, than, than uh, uh, voluntary migrants in, in Western territories or uh, um, local population in, in uh, uh, central Poland, that could also potentially ex explain our results, but it doesn't. And we have a very uh, uh, direct way to, to, show, uh, to show that. Sec uh, third, in fact, we also examine whether differential war experiences or victimization during the Second World War could uh, ex uh, explain our results. And here I should say right away that it is true that generally more towards the east there was more victimization and more uh, uh, you know people uh, so people who whose ancestors lived uh, towards the east have more people uh, being injured or dead in their families compared to people who lived uh, whose ancestors lived uh, in the in the in the west uh, uh, during uh, or before the second world war yet uh, we show that the effect of Cressy does not depend on the uh, exposure uh, to uh, Second World War or victimization. So that's not the story either. And finally, and that's very important for migration literature, and I'm sure some of you are working in migration literature, which is very, very vibrant, we uh, directly try to tackle the possibility that selection uh, 
particularly of voluntary migrants could drive this result, but we'll also address the possible selection of classy migrants. And just to preview, I can tell you that there was no selection of classy migrants. Everybody was forced to leave pretty much. And as far as voluntary migrants, uh, we show that if anything, that should undermine, uh, so should work against finding the results in Western territories. However, we have results for the whole point and Poland and where there's no selection and for the Western territories. So finally, with that package, uh, we arrived to one uh, story, one mechanism, which is, seems to be fully consistent with the data and with quite a lot of anecdotal evidence, which, uh, which uh, uh, some of which I will present to you. This has to do with the shift in preferences towards investing in human capital, which is a more mobile capital, as opposed to physical capital, because of being expropriated and forced to move. So this is precisely the uprootedness hypothesis a la testimony of Aunt Sonia of Amos Oz. That's why I uh, started with that uh, quote. So this work overall uh, contributes to a very large literature on migration. In particular, there is a, a substrand of this literature which uh, uh, studies forced migration. And uh, there are two Substrands of this uh, uh, literature. One studies the effect of forced migration on local economy. The other uh, studies the effects of forced migration on migrants themselves. Of course, we contribute to that part. And uh, I should say that our uh, paper, to the best of my knowledge, is the first one which is able to provide convincing empirical support to the uprootedness hypothesis. And hopefully, if we have time during the discussion, I'll, we'll, we'll be able to uh, think about. The fact that given that we are able to pin down this mechanism, that may have important policy implications. We argue, despite the fact that we're looking at a very, very specific historical experiment. So, uh, in addition, we do show that uh, this effect lasts for several generations. We observe three generations, and you know we don't observe more because that's uh, that's uh, uh, the, the last uh, survey we did was uh, 2016. But there's no reason why that could be reversed in the future. So, with that, let me uh, go a little bit uh, into uh, details uh, of, uh, um, uh, of the paper. First, let me just give you a little bit more about the background. So, what happened when Poland moved uh, on the map of Europe? So, that change in borders triggered ma mass population movements. And the first and foremost, these were not movements of Poles, these were movements of Germans. First of all, Germans fled as the war was uh, approaching its end, but millions were still remaining in Western territories uh, after the war. They were expelled. And overall, this mass migration amounts to, there are different accounts of it, but about, uh, depending on how you count, between five and eight million people. So it's a, it's a mass movement of Germans west. Second, there was, and that's what we are studying, it was uh, about uh, 2.1 million Poles who were forced to move from Cressy and who were resettled in the new borders, borders of New Poland, out of whom 73% uh, moved to Western territories, which were freed from Germans at that time, and the rest settled in the in the central Poland. But that's again not all. So these are two episodes of forced migration, which were associated with this uh, move of Poland on the map, but there were also a mass voluntary migration. In particular, uh, central Polish authorities invited voluntary migrants from central Poland, and actually from abroad, even from France, to come and settle in Western territories. Uh, and they came to benefit from housing, land, uh, and infrastructure, which were left behind by the Germans. So overall, it, uh, of course, there is also the, uh, uh, the disappearance, uh, the perish of, uh, of uh, Jews who were a very large uh, Polish minority before, before the war. So all of these uh, had a huge socioeconomic and uh, demographic shock on Poland, but arguably Western territories uh, saw the biggest change because essentially most of the population changed there. And there was very little continuity. In particular, 
uh, before the war in 39, about 9 million people were the, was the total population of Western territories, a little bit less than that. Out of which about 8 million were Germans who uh, were gone by 1950 and 1 million Poles who actually some of whom uh, stay, stayed behind. So these were, these were ethnic Poles who lived in Germany before who chose who had, were given the possibility to and who chose to stay in Poland when Poland came to them, to their home. And I will refer to them as autochtones. So, uh, that, that's uh, that's uh, the situation uh, right before the war. And in, in the first post-war uh, Polish census, census which uh, uh, took place in 1950, uh, we see there is a drastic change in uh, Western territories. In particular, the total population was substantially smaller. It was uh, 5.6 million people. Almost all of them were Poles. There were some Jews, but very few. But you can think about this as pretty much 100% uh, Polish population. Uh, out of which uh, the only difference between uh, this population was the origin of these Poles. Where do they come from? In particular, 30% of population Western territories were, were Poles who were forced migrants from Kresy, the territory which uh, Poland lost. 50% of Western territories population was voluntary migrants from central Poland. Uh, and 20% uh, of autochtones, and it's important to note that uh, these were not, uh, the 20% of autochtones were not uniformly distributed in Western territories. There were some areas where there were a lot of them, and uh, there are many areas where there were few. Right away, just maybe to uh, preview some of the possible questions, it's worth saying that the voluntary migration uh, came pretty much at the same time as uh, the uh, forced migration into Western territories. And we have data on the flow every month, uh, uh, starting with in uh, 46 uh, until the, uh, the migration succeeded. And we see that it's basically one to one, the number of arrivals uh, from Cressy and from Central Poland. So, uh, how did uh, the, these migrants, uh, uh, were, how were they subjected to this forced move? And in order just to get a sense of uh, what it was, I would like to give you another quote. This is a testimony of a uh, forced Cressy migrant. So he uh, describes uh, how he first uh, learned about uh, the need to move. He says, and so it happened. The marshal came, leave, he said. But where should I go, I asked. To Poland, he replied. And I say, I am in Poland. And he says, this is not Poland anymore. So you can imagine how much of a shock all of this was to these uh, miners. And this picture just basically shows you a family of crazy migrants who were, who were put on the trains. Uh, uh, and it, it took them essentially some of them even se several months to get uh, reach to the uh, uh, final destination, and uh, some of them uh, had, could uh, step off the train in central Poland, particularly those who had some relatives in central Poland. But many came to Western territories with a few belongings which they were allowed to take with them, but most of the things which they owned for generations. In their, in their homes in Cressy, they had to leave behind, obviously. Um, uh, in parallel with this, there was a big campaign by the authorities in order to invite uh, voluntary migrants from central Poland. Why the authorities were doing this? This was because they wanted to populate the Western territories by Poles as quickly as possible in order to basically um, make that change of the border irreversible. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, anthropological and historical accounts that both migrants from Kress and migrants from central Poland were treated exactly equally in Western territories. The only thing which was needed for the authorities is that uh, people settle in. And this poster basically is an example of how 
uh, the uh, Polish authorities advertised uh, the what they basically called the Western frontier for 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 New Poland with abandoned land in this particular case, but also abandoned physical capital in towns. So a lot of people indeed responded to this advertisement. However, given that there was a voluntary migration, I should say right away that this leads us to the question, is there some selection in, in, in terms of who uh, among voluntary migrants, among Poles from central Poland decided to migrate uh, to Western territories. So we're going to just look at that uh, directly in our empirical analysis. So uh, let me uh, move on a little bit quicker now, and uh, uh, I will uh, uh, give you a little bit of details about the, the data. So I already mentioned that there are two big surveys which we use. One is called Diagnosis Survey, which uh, actually was a rotating panel which took place every other year during the transition period in Poland. And uh, unfortunately, the current administration uh, for now discontinued the diagnosis. It was the best uh, source of information about, you know, Polish uh, views and aspirations on all sorts of different uh, uh, questions and economic situation as well. So it's uh, like a LSMS survey, and it's important that it's a massive survey, particularly the wave, 2015 wave, to which we were able to, uh, to add questions, had almost 30,000 people, which is a very, very important resource. I hope that uh, the diagnosis survey will continue eventually, but for now it is discontinued. So to this uh, wave in, of the 2015, we added a set of questions on whether any of the ancestors of the respondent were from Kresse, and if so, where exactly from? And we digitized these locations. And in 2016, we conducted our own survey where we have a lot more detailed data on a uh, place of living of each of the ancestor of the respondent from the generation of youngest adults before the war. So we know uh, the uh, if, for example, uh, it were the it were the grandparents' generation of the respondents who were forced to move from Cressy. We are we are asking about the grandpa grandparents' generation, and we know the location of uh, living for all ancestors, be that from Cressy or not from Cressy. And overall, the, this amounts for almost 12,000 ancestors. And just to give you a uh, little um, illustration of where people are coming from, so these are the origins of ancestors of people who now live in these uh, bluish, greenish areas in Western territories. So as you can see, they come from everywhere in the Second Polish Republic, and also some are the descendants of autochthons who uh, who uh, uh, lived in these territories before um, the uh, before uh, the war. So I just suddenly lost a thread to my slides, but I'll get. I, I'm getting back. Uh, right. So so. Uh, of course, knowing the uh, uh, ancestral location of all ancestors give us a lot more power in trying to understand what's happening and trying to examine the mechanism. You're going you're gonna to see this uh, uh, as we go along. So we merge these census data using the locations, which I just uh, 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 told you about, the location of respondent and location of ancestors to the historical cens censuses in particular, uh, the one census is very special. The first uh, post-war uh, Polish census, to, which took place in 1950, it actually directly has information and questions on population movements. And it's very useful to us because we actually can know a lot more about overall picture of movements, and we can uh, test and compare uh, the movements which are implied by what our respondents remember about the location of their ancestors and the direct movements from the Polish census. And it turns out that it, they're very, very close, which means two things. One is that Poles from our surveys did remember very well where their ancestors lived. And this is not surprising because this was a very important event in the psyche of Polish people, this, this uh, age of mass migration. And also, this means that there was 
very little migration afterwards. So we also use, uh, make use of the pre-war population censuses. There were two interwar Poland censuses and some imperial censuses uh, at the time of the partition of Poland. So with that, uh, let me uh, go to the uh, uh, discussion of uh, uh, the, the actual results. So first, what we do, we look at the diagnosa, the, you know, the all polls uh, survey, which is a mass survey, and we just simply compare the uh, different uh, uh, outcomes on educational attainment, like years of education, secondary education uh, attainment, or high education attainment for polls who have and who have no ancestors who were forced to move from Cressy. And it turns out that there is a very strong, robust, and significant advantage uh, uh, for Poles uh, with ancestors from Cressy compared to all other Poles. And we can uh, slice the data in many different ways. We can look at uh, all Poles and rural and urban areas, central Poland and Western territories. Importantly, what we do, we control for the local labor market. So we are comparing people <laughs> from the same uh, locations who work in the same labor market today by uh, putting in municipality fixed effects or county fixed effects. Municipality fixed effects is very uh, demanding specification because it actually is smaller than the commuting area. And yet we see this result. So, but this is just the overall picture of comparing people with some ancestors to uh, to all other poles. However, the all other poles uh, actually are diverse in terms of their hi uh, historical heritage. So in order to take that into account, we use our own survey, which is much more detailed, which allows us to, uh, to see whether ancestors lived in rural area or urban area, because of course the mass, uh, mass movements may also uh, be confounded with the a move from rural to, to, to urban areas in particular, and we need to take, take care of that. On, turn, on top of that, the all other poles are com comprised of poles with ancestry which comes from central Poland, from western territories, from abroad, Poland, from western as compared to Cressy. And what we can do with our survey is to just basically pin down the com any of these comparison groups very well. So, uh, and the first thing we do with our ancestry survey is that we replicate the result which we get from the uh, from the diagnosa, just uh, looking at the dummy for ancestor, any ancestor from Cressy. But then, uh, and that's what's reported in columns from three to eight of this table, we actually uh, look at the exact share of ancestors from Cressy compared to, and here the uh, only one missing category, which is the comparison group, is the share of ancestors from central Poland. And we also control for the share of ancestors from Western territories, from abroad, and also the rural urban composition of them. And no, no matter what we do, we see that uh, respondents with ancestors from Cressy are the most educated. And it also is irrespective of the actual measure we take. Uh, on top of that, interestingly, we find that those who never needed to move for whatever reason, the autochtones are the least educated in Western territories. Then there is uh, uh, voluntary migrants who are a little bit more educated. And then there are Cressy migrants who are forced to move who are most educated. Importantly, and that's, uh, I will go through this very quickly, we can look at this uh, uh, survey uh, at uh, the level of ancestor. So instead of the respondent, we look at the ancestors and we know a lot about the location of ancestors, so we can explore that. And that's what we do. First of all, we, in the previous table, which I showed you very quickly, just replicates the results at that level. But then, uh, what we can do, we can uh, look at the analysis at the at the border of, of, of Cressy. So basically try to see the regression discontinuity here. So, uh, so the idea is the following, that in principle, the higher education of Cressy descendants could be driven by uh, pre-existing differences if attitudes towards education were different between you know, people in Cressy and people in central Poland before Second World War, even if uh, the literacy rates were similar. So we do see the already from the data that the literacy rates were similar, but it could be that the aspirations were different. 
There was just no possibility to gain more education. If that were the case, we would uh, uh, we, 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 we would confound our effects by that. So, so how can we address this point? We can look at the discontinuity at the Cressy border which actually never was a border before the uh, end of the Second World War. So essentially, well, we, first of all, we just see that the uh, before the Second World War, if we look at literacy of Roman Catholics, it actually is completely the same. And if you if you look very close at the border of, of, of Cressy, at the same time, if we look today at those respondents in here in Diagnosa who whose ancestors lived just to the east of Cressy border and therefore had to force to move with those who live uh, right to the west of Cressy border and therefore could stay in central Poland, we have this very, very big jump. However, what we can also do using our ancestry survey, we can make it even more uh, powerful analysis by looking at the people who today live in the same municipalities in Western territories, whose ancestors come from uh, very close to each other in different, like uh, of different locations, just to the east or just to the west of Cressy border. And this is the analysis which we present here. So here we look at, uh, given that we control for municipality fixed effects, we here look at people who uh, live today in exactly the same places with exactly the same conditions and whose ancestors lived also very close to each other in a single country, but uh, those who were to the east of uh, Cressy border were forced to move, those who are, were to the uh, west of Cressy border moved voluntarily. And we see exactly the same result, which basically highlights the uh, fact that uh, uh, Cressy migrants are, or descendants of Cressy migrants are more educated both compared to stayers in central Poland and to, to those voluntary migrants who moved to uh, Western territories. The validity of this discontinuity analysis, however, is based on the arbitrariness of border. So the question then is, where does this Cressy border come from? And actually, the only historical account which uh, we have of this border is that it coincided more or less with the with the Curzon line, so-called Curzon line. And Curzon line, as I already mentioned, never was a real border ever before, but it was still drawn. So the question is, how was it drawn? And in fact, in the middle area, it uh, uh, coincides with the natural boundary. There's a river here, but there were several different variants of course and line, both in the north and, and, and in the south, which allows us to verify that it is uh, really true, even in our effect is really true, even in places where the border was really chosen essentially arbitrarily, where there are no natural boundaries between uh, Kresy and, and central Poland, and indeed, this is what, what we find. So overall, with this, we can safely um, conclude that, you know, there is this effect. So the question is, where does it come from? And here, I would like, uh, again, to st start with the, uh, our, our discussion of the mechanism, to start uh, with a quote. This is a, a testimony of a Cressy migrant, which will, and there were many collected by anthropologists, and this is one of the many which we have. So let me quote, in Western territories, there was a specific situation. People did not attach great importance to material wealth. After all, nobody had it at that time. Most of the people who came here were still living in their memories of places of their origin and of material things that had belonged to their families for generations. In a new life situation, and this is where the mechanism comes from, in this quote, the cult of new values emerged, the values that are indestructible, that cannot be lost, that die with the men, the cult of knowledge of skills which can resist cataclysms. And here we see direct parallel to the quote from uh, Aunt Sonia, uh, which, which I started with. So the question is, how can we test this directly? And luckily, in diagnosis, there are a set of, there's a set of questions which allows us to, uh, to pin that down. First of all, we look at what are the aspirations uh, 
or about the education of children of our respondents. And we see that uh, with, for those respondents who have ancestors from Cressy, it's significantly higher. And importantly, it is significantly higher once we control for their own educational level, which means it's not just, you know, because parents, if parents have higher education than kids, would have higher education. There is more to that, and this is a cultural component here, which we see. And to the question of what on earth, what all in all constitutes success in life, it's also very interesting that uh, those respondents who have ancestors from Cressy are less likely to pick material goods. And again, this is not fully explained, uh, and actually almost not at all explained by their level of, edu of their education. So it is again uh, a cultural uh, uh, phenomenon. So uh, then, what we do is we try to see whether these attitudes and aspirations actually translate into real behavior in terms of investment in physical capital or physical goods. And in diagnosa, we have uh, questions uh, on whether people own a list of 20 different physical items like uh, dacha, country house, uh, 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 boat, uh, uh, home cinema, things like this. And uh, apart from whether respondent owns these things or not, there is a question of if, if they don't own it, whether this is for financial reasons because they cannot afford it or for non-financial reasons. So what we see is that overall, uh, people who uh, uh, have crazy ancestors own more things just because they are more successful, they are more educated, they are they're richer. And we show that too in our analysis. I just don't have time to talk about it. But what's interesting is that they are much more likely to choose not owning things which they can afford. And that's uh, something which basically is a material. Uh, 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 so, so this, this this is how the their aspirations are translated into the actual ch investment choices. So, I would like to pause here and ask how many uh, minutes do I have still? If I have any, Piotr. So, so whether I can talk about alternative mechanism, or we should do that uh, during the discussion phase. I th I think you should wrap it up because All we. Right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, we, we, we have can, like can, yeah, 13 yeah. minutes left and no. I already have some questions here. All right, wonderful. So, so I, given that I already previewed some of these alternative explanations, I'll skip them now and maybe they will come up in the discussion. So, but uh, just uh, if not, then please uh, refer to, uh, to our paper on this. So, with this, I would like to uh, conclude with just three points. First, uh, we, our paper shows the evidence that forced migration increases investment in education, you know, over three generations. And this is because of the change in attitudes towards investment in physical capital versus uh, human capital. In other words, the uprootedness hypothesis. And given that uh, forced migration nowadays, unfortunately, is a, a very frequent phenomenon, uh, think about natural disasters, wars, and ethnic persecutions, we think that our work, even though it is uh, very special, it looks at a very special historical experiment, we, we argue that all of these uh, reasons for forced migration actually uh, have in common this idea of uprootedness. So people who have to move have to leave their um, belongings, their, whole, their, their houses behind, which means that given that we pin down this mechanism, we could formulate the policy implication. And even though, of course, policymakers understand the importance of education, it probably is even potentially higher. Uh, uh, in, uh, uh, there are potentially high returns for uh, providing access to education for people who are refugees than it was originally thought. So I would like to stop here. Thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Ekaterina. So um, I have well, I already have two free questions, and some of them are, are about the alternative mechanism. So you, it will be also opportunity for you to return to that slide. So Sam Jones of Wider is asking, 
if capital, if physical capital was more abundant in the Western, in the Western territories than it was in Cresce, then could a mechanism be a high complementary between the physical and human capital in, in, in Western territories? Uh, well, the complementarity is general, but the, or the stock, which these people uh, achieved was higher. So perhaps that could be a mechanism as well. Uh, that's an excellent question, and uh, the important thing here is that uh, we compare in Western territories. So we have all sorts of different analyses, but one of the analyses is comparing the uh, effects uh, for our outcomes for uh, forced migrants from Cressy and for voluntary migrants from Central Poland. And it's important that, uh, of course, there might be some some important interactions about the uh, in incentives to gain education and the presence of physical capital, particularly if if there is a uh, factor in which you could you could be an engineer, you are more likely to uh, try to gain uh, engineering education. But that applies exactly in the same way. We argue for. Uh, voluntary migrants from central Poland and for forced migrants in uh, fr from Cressy when we talk about locations in the Western territories. Indeed, the capital was abandoned. And uh, uh, part of the reason why voluntary migrants from central Poland uh, came to Western territories is precisely in order to uh, take advantage of this abundance. So, so yeah, please. Right. So, so the next question is, uh, is similar, but um, uh, and also addresses the selection issue. So, could you please elaborate more about uh, the selection mechanism? It could be that, first of all, the least educated state and not moved to Poland, because we know that there is still a Polish minority in Ukraine, Belarus, and so on, Lithuania, and so on. So, perhaps the least educated state. And then maybe uh, that's like a joint question from Michał Rutkowski, and now add my, add, I, I add my part. That there could be a selection of more and less educated, of more or less entrepreneur-oriented uh, forced migrants, depending on the location where they went to. So let's say the more educated people from Vilnius, maybe they went to Wrocław or Szczecin, and the least educated ended up maybe somewhere else went to, you mm -hmm. know, the Missouri region or, or whatever. So perhaps there was like a selection within a selection in terms of which locations they picked. So both are excellent questions. And uh, so let me, let me take uh, them one after another. So all the questions here are about the possible selection of Cressy migrants, either from the on, at the origin or to different destinations. So as far as the uh, selection at the origin, so uh, you are absolutely right in uh, saying that there are there is still uh, a small minority of poles which were which were um, uh, which were left and actually some living still in these in these areas uh, which which uh, uh, used to be crazy. So uh, here it's very important to note that there was a very different policy. On of uh, of local authorities as far as uh, the enforcement of this order, which came from above, from the uh, head of the uh, Belarusian, Lithuanian, and and Ukrainian Republic on on expelling the uh, the Poles. So, so the order came from above, but local authorities very quickly realized that actually, as far as uh, the uh, poles from rural area, they were very important in provision of, uh, of food for the, for the local population. So they, they realized that in some places, if, if uh, one kicks out in one instance all poles, then you know, who is going to grow, grow bread? So they tried to... Uh, uh, you know, slow down or actually, you know, keep some of these uh, poles in. So, which meant that there was a, a very big uh, difference in, in terms of the rates of uh, indiscriminate uh, expulsion between urban and rural areas. And uh, we look at the uh, at the subsample of Kriasi migrants who came from urban areas separately and from rural areas separately, and we find 
no differential effect, which means that the the differential uh, with, within uh, controlling for the fact where you come from rural area from from urban area, there is there is no uh, selection. On top of that, there was a big uh, so so what the, this reason for staying was particularly important in uh, Belarus and in Lithuania as far as Ukraine is concerned. There, the and, and this is true, you can see that in the data now, the local Polish minority after this mass movements uh, 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 occurred was much smaller. And the reason for this was the uh, animosity between uh, Ukraine, Ukrainians and Poles, which did not exist in Lithuania or with, with animosity with, of Poles with local population or in Belarus. So there was uh, less, indiscrim less uh, discriminate uh, expulsion in Ukraine, and again, if we look at the uh, magnitude of the effect, is exactly the same. So, which tells us that the selection was on on if 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 there was any that was not in 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 uh, um, uh, according to the to to the education. Importantly, oh. also uh, here, I, I will just uh, add another another point to this. Uh, Okay, hold on. I, uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, yeah, yeah. So importantly, also we we basically made a sort of back on the envelope exercise, trying to understand how initial educational gap should be in order to explain the results which we have, and it's it's uh, it's out of proportion. So it's it's definitely not selection at the source. So now the next question was the selection of the destinations. We actually. Uh, studied that quite a lot, and in particular, given that most of the movements of Cressy migrants were th through rails, whereas most of the movements of voluntary migrants to Western territories were, you know, on, on horse-drawn carts, on a little bit on rail as well, but also some even walked across, across the border. We actually could predict patterns of where uh, different uh, migrants ended up. And uh, the the uh, what what we see is uh, that irrespective of uh, the path on which and selection into the destinations, we our main results are drawn from within the destination. And uh, uh, therefore, it, it it cannot drive our results. You are absolutely right that that we see essentially the lateral move and move along the railroads. On top of that, actually, the Polish authorities stated that what they would like, particularly for those migrants who come from rural areas, so that they end up in destination places which are sort of close in terms of. Uh, uh, agricultural suitability in terms of land quality to their original locations. The point which, which, uh, however, I would like to make is none of this could possibly uh, account for the for the results which we have because we can stick in fixed effects uh, for for the for the destination location. All right, excellent. Thank you. I think it's very clear uh, how the selection works here, or rather, not works in terms of uh, driving the results. I have one more question from my colleague Jan Gromatsky, which is a very different question, and it's about external validity. So there is a lot of forced movement of people around the world these days. And uh, can we think about the outcomes of your study as a universally applicable, or perhaps in in communist Poland there was a um, there was an increase in educational attainment, and the government want to invest in education of the of the you know of the underclass let's say from the second republic another excellent question and uh, uh, here of course as i as i mentioned before we are studying a very very special case so the question of external validity is very important and the only uh, so, so I, I'll tell you what you know. Given that this is a hypothetical question, I cannot. So so far, we have a lot of evidence that forced migrants have uh, uh, higher education from different uh, settings, and we uh, cite all of these uh, pieces of evidence in the in the paper. However, in these other settings, there are other confounding factors which actually you know are the ones who, which are probably driving this. Uh, 
could uh, our effect uh, be present there too? Of course, yes. But the point is that empirically we cannot separate the two. So why we think that uh, there is some external validity to what we are doing is is uh, the reason for this is only uh, is a single reason essentially, which is that in our case we are able to say what the mechanism is. And then we can hypothetically ask ourselves, does this mechanism, uh, is this mechanism present in other episodes of forced migration? And uh, the answer for most episodes of forced migration or some kind of expropriation, the answer seems to me yes. And it's precisely not the documenting the fact, but understanding what behind it, it makes us certain that we can apply this to other settings. I understand that uh, I, it would be nice to have another study of another uh, setting where we can separate this, single out this mechanism to test it. I'm still searching for it, and uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna try to find that. But uh, so far, my answer to this is purely theoretical. All right. Thanks so much. We we ran out of time. It was an excellent talk and a, and a very illuminating discussion. Uh, so thank you very much again for delivering that lecture. I think it's a very relevant uh, topic and very relevant findings for the current state of the world, I would say. Um, so thanks again. And just a short reminder that the next session will start in 15 minutes, the same, the same channel. Thank you very much, Ekaterina. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the questions and for giving me this opportunity.